And my wife was, um, we were praying as a family this morning and my, my wife, Rose, was talking about the Lord and, and the importance, you know, when we're in this, this time of isolation, when we're in this time of uh, just being in our house, that we don't get caught up in just doing stuff for ourselves. that we don't get caught up in this place of just being busy with what we need to do, whether it's our work, our study, you know, social media, whatever it is, but that there is someone who that we put first, and that's the Lord, and that we need to put him first, that our life will be built on a firm foundation when we put the Lord first. And you know, however that looks like, it can be prayer, it can be worship, it can be uh, reading the Bible, even giving uh, of the, the, the tithe and offering to the Lord. It can be all these things. And, uh, you know, we need to understand that when we are in that place where He is first and His Word is what we build our life upon, everything else works out. And so often our fears and our anxieties, our frustrations are there because we haven't put God first in our life. And our nation, our, our, our world has, you know, put self first. And, and God is crying out in his heart, will my people please come back and put me first in their hearts. And I really want to encourage you in that place, wherever you are right now, whatever trials you have, whatever issues are going on in your life, that just come in your heart and put God first. To say, Lord, I want you to be first in my life. I want you to be first in all that I do, all that I say, all that I think. I want to be in that place of gratitude to you, Father. I want to be in that place where you are everything to me. Jesus promised us in Matthew chapter 6 that if we seek his kingdom first and his righteousness, then all these other things will be added unto us. You know, the things that we need every day will be added unto us. And right now we need his peace. We need his assurance. We need his love and his care and his comfort in these uncertain times. And I just trust that as you seek him in prayer and in his word, that you'll find him. That's his promise. And he will look after the rest. Amen. So we're going to go to his word now. I just want to open in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that as we read your word, that you will bless your word, that you will anoint it, and that it will speak to us deeply about what you want to say today. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you're at home, wherever you are, just open your Bible. Uh, we want to read from Mark 10, 42 to 44. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. And you know, our culture is so centered on self. You know, the, the measure of our culture is even the selfie. You know, we get our phone out and we, we take a, a photo of ourself and we post it because we want people to like what we're doing. We want people to appreciate what we look like. And so even the modern culture, the modern photograph of the day is called a selfie. And, you know, our, our culture is so centered on self. It is our God and we worship at its altar every day. And I want to just tell you briefly the story of Esther. I won't go into a lot of details. You can read it in the book of Esther in the Bible. But Esther was a, a woman who was chosen to be queen out of many, many women. She went through a long process in that journey to become queen. And Esther was a Jew. And the, the, the Jewish people were hated by a man named Haman. And he determined to destroy them all. And so he went to the king with a plan to kill all of the Jewish people. The king did not know that his queen, Esther, was a Jew. And so the king agreed with this plan of Haman's. And the people, the Jewish people, were very, very fearful of what was going to happen. And there was a, an uncle of Esther's named Mordecai, and he wrote to Esther in the palace. 
He wasn't able to visit her in the palace. He was socially distanced from Esther in the palace. And he wrote to her, asking her to stand for her people. And if we can just go to Esther 4, verse 12 to 16. Because Esther wrote to, back to Mordecai and said, I can't go and see the king. I can't plead for his people because he hasn't called me. And if he calls me and I go to him, everything will be okay. But if he doesn't call me and I go to him, death will be my penalty unless he holds out his scepter to me and forgives me for entering his presence without being called. And so we pick up in, in uh, 4 verse 12 of Esther. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. And I believe that this is a time for the church, for God's people to be the church. We spoke about that last week, and I want to follow on from that today, that we need to be the church. And, uh, you know, we need to stand up as a time such as this. I believe that as our world is hurting, as our world is struggling with coming to grips with what is going on with COVID-19, the church has a very important part to play. I believe time is given to us in view of eternity. And this time that we have is a time for us to share the love of Jesus. We are all in our place, in our position for such a time as this. Just as Esther was in the king's house for such a time as that to save her people, so we are in a time such as this to save our people of our nation. There is a battle to fight for the lost broken and hurting, people in fear, people in anxiety, people who are scared of what has come upon our land. People from every walk of life need rescuing at this time. Each one of us are uniquely placed to reach the people around us. The church is uniquely placed to reach the community, but how much more where you live, you work, you study, you walk your dog, you exercise. How much more are you in a place to reach your community, even at this time when people are hurting? I want to discuss today the master key of an abundant life, a life that will be guaranteed to produce a harvest. Jack Haynes and Wayne Myers have mined the depths of this teaching, and I want to acknowledge their input into what I'm going to share today. If I said there's one word to describe the master key to abundant life, what do you think it might be? Many would think it's love or giving or joy. But no, I don't believe that is the one word answer to the master key. General William Booth, who started the Salvation Army, pointed this word out to his officers one time. He could not attend a meeting. He was not able to be there. He was socially distanced from them. So he sent a telegram and all of the leaders of the Salvation Army gathered around to see what was important in what he'd written in this telegram. And they opened it up and there was one word in that telegram and that word was others. Living our life focused on others is the master key to the most abundant God-like life we can live. Living to give, living to serve, living to bless, living to share. This is God's heart. It is summed up in Christ's life and death on the cross. How could we think any other way could possibly satisfy? Let's go back to Mark 10, 42 to 44 and read that again. 
Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Jesus was explaining to his disciples that abundant life is not lived in knowing it all, having it all, but in serving others. John 10.10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. What is that? It is to take things for himself. The thief comes to steal, kill and destroy so that he can have what he wants. But Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The thief comes into your house and takes everything to satisfy himself. The Lord Jesus came to give all of himself. Dr. Albert Schweitzer said, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I know, the only ones among you who will be really, really happy are those who will have sought and found how to serve. To the degree our life is swallowed up in the service of others is the degree to which we have truly begun to live as Christ has called us to live. The key to abundant living is not what can I get. That is the way of the thief. The thief breaks into your home to take what he can get for himself. The key is what can I give? How can I share? How can I bless? That is the Savior's way. Shallow, empty living says, what's in it for me? Rich, deep, fulfilled living says, what's in it for others? Trumbull said, people who live for self never succeed in satisfying self or anybody else. Today is Palm Sunday, as I said before. And today is the day that we remember that Jesus entered into Jerusalem and all of Jerusalem had gathered together to see Jesus enter and they were worshipping, they were calling out Hosanna, they thought a king had come to give them freedom. But a king had come to give his life. Let's go to John 12, 24. Very truly I tell you, Jesus is speaking, Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. If you take this at face value, it is hardly an astounding truth. When you put a seed in the ground, it grows. But Jesus wasn't talking about seeds at all. He was talking about their lives. You know, if you take a raw stalk of wheat in your hand, rub the chaff off it and take the wheat seed and eat it, you'll find the experience overrated. There are some things you will notice about that seed that you're trying to eat. It's small, it's hard and it's bland. When you do bite down on it and get it to break so that you can finally chew it, it's not very filling. And most of it gets caught in your teeth. Jesus was saying that a life focused on self is just like that wheat, small, hard, bland, and unfulfilled. And no matter how much you try to fill yourself with all the stuff that makes you happy, you're never fulfilled. You always want more and more and more because life is not fulfilled in what you can get for yourself it's fulfilled in what we can give to others many christians are like that grain of wheat that abides alone they won't give they won't share and they won't bless they want to not sorry they don't want to let go of their life and they are dying of boredom however others find the purpose of their life A seed is meant to be planted and be fruitful and multiply. If you take one seed and put it in the ground, you get a hundred seeds. 
If you in turn put those hundred seeds back in the ground, you get thousands of seeds. If you then plant those seeds, you get a farm. If you then plant those seeds from that farm, you feed a city, a state, or even a nation. If you keep planting those seeds, one day you'll feed the world. That's the power of seed. There's no power in eating seed. The power of seed is in planting it. Jesus was talking about the power and potential of your life to transform this world when you're willing to be planted in his purpose. Here is that word, others. Live to give, live to share, live to bless, live to serve. This is the highest level of living available to a man or woman on the planet. Jesus was saying that if you live to give of your life, if you live to serve, you'll be first in the kingdom of heaven. Romans 12, 1 to 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. We live in an age of self, self-realization, self-promotion, self-assertion, self-expression, the selfie, all point to our love for self. What's mine is mine and I'll keep it. And what's yours is mine and I'll take that if I can't have it. That's the spirit of this age, but it's not the spirit of Jesus. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. To serve and to give is the highest level of living available to mankind. It is the most godlike thing a man can do. Jesus came for others. Jesus lived for others. Jesus died and gave his life on a cross for others. In fact, he gave his life for this entire world. That was his heart, to come and live a life on earth, to give his life for you. And Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father at this very moment. And what is he doing? Is he sitting back and enjoying the ride, sitting back and relaxing on the couch? No, he is right now interceding for others. Romans eight thirty four. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Right now, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, praying for you, interceding for you, lifting up your name to his Father and saying, Father, hear them, see them, know their heart, see them, Lord, show them your love. Right now, he's praying for this world. And what are we doing as Christians? You know, people say, well, if God loves this world, why is there pain and suffering? You know, we have free choice to do what we do. God gave us that choice. And what are we as Christians doing? What are we choosing to do to help others at this time? What are we choosing to do to be light, love, and service to others? What are we choosing to do? You know, God has given us the choice to do or not to do. That is our choice. And he's given you the choice to either respond to his love or to reject his love. And the world is in this place, not because God wants it in this place, but because we've rejected his love. We've chosen to go our own way and to live for self. Jesus came for others. Jesus lived for others. Jesus died for others. Not satisfied with the sacrifice of the cross, even now he's praying for us. Philippians 2 verse 5, let's go there. Philippians 2 verse 5. 
in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. The mind of Christ is that of an overcomer, a victor, and there is no fear, doubt, defeat, or lack in that mind. All that is true, but the context of Philippians 2.5 is the life that embraces pouring out of oneself for others, giving myself up, laying myself down for others. This is the mind of serving and giving, the same mindset of Christ who came to this life, this world, to serve us and to give his life for us. This is the mind that says, how can I die for someone today? And I don't mean physically die. I mean die to what we want, die to what we desire, and look to someone else's need. What can I give up or lay down for someone else today? Do you want the mind of the thief or the mind of the saviour? We must break free from selfishness. That's what's in it for me attitude. The spirit of the world says the more I get, the more I've got. But Jesus says the more you give, the more you get. The world says build your nest egg of security. Jesus says, just climb up here in my nest and I'll take care of you forever. There are many Christians today who honestly love the Lord, but they don't live to give or bless or share. It's not because they don't want to, they just don't understand the concept of true prosperity. And, you know, prosperity has been talked about by churches and I think they've missed the understanding of what true prosperity is. It's not about what you can get for yourself. It's understanding that God has everything for his people. And when we live to be a blessing to others, we understand the true prosperity there is in Christ. If your bank is your source or your job, job or the government or the share market, then it is obvious you are not secure. The share market is crashing. Our savings are worth less than they were days ago, let alone months ago. We have to understand that these things cannot be secure. I looked at the Australian dollar, you know, it dropped from whatever a few years ago when it was 80 cents and now it's down to, to 60 cents. It even dropped almost to 50 cents US. And if, if your, your value and your security is money, how can you even be secure when the value of that money changes every day? If money is your source, if it's your security, if what's in your bank is the place that keeps you safe, you cannot truly be secure. But if God is your source, if God is the one who you look to every day, you can be truly secure. Let me illustrate it like this. Imagine a pie and each slice of the pie is the resources that you have in your life, that as you Slice that pie and give out those bits of pie, your time, your money, your resources, your emotion, your energy, your thinking, your actions. As you give out all these pieces of pie, at the end of the day, there's no pie left. And that's why we try and hold on to the pie because we want something for ourselves. But when you're secure, when you're secure in God, you understand that your Father in heaven your God is the baker, and he has an unlimited supply of pie. My father is the baker, and I know that every day he's got that supply. If God is your source, you want to live for others. You want to live to bless, to share, to serve. That's the passion of your heart because you know that God will supply every need in your life. Let's go back to Romans 12, 1 to 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. The mold of this world is contrary to the gospel. It is contrary to faith. It is contrary to faith-fulfilled living. Don't let the world dictate to you your lifestyle. 
The world is not happy. You try and copy the world's lifestyle, you will not be happy. You will not be fulfilled. The world is looking for an answer. And it's tried to find it in money, in wealth, in prestige, and it's still not happy. Why on earth would you look to the world to find out how to be happy? The world is not enjoying an abundant life. Hollywood is slim. It's trendy. It has nice haircuts, nice clothes, and cute little pouty lips, but they are not happy. Why would you let them model a lifestyle for you? The world says, get, get, get. Take, take, take. Mine, mine, mine. Let Jesus fill your life with a heart for others. John 13, 1 to 5. John 13, 1 to 5. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And verses 12 to 17, let's jump to there. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Do you want to be blessed? Blessed by a God in heaven who has unlimited resources. Then live to serve others. Jesus came to this earth to give of his life, to give of all that he had, to show us the way that when we live for others, he gives to us. He lives for us. A self Serving life is so empty, so boring, so unfulfilling. A self-serving marriage or job or church is so dull and painstaking. The real joy and excitement and living comes in giving. Acts 20 verse 35. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. According to Jesus, we do not measure how blessed we are by what we have or by what we have been given. And this is where we've missed it, guys. We think we're blessed because of what we have. Jesus said the measure of a blessed life is how much we have released, how much we have given shared and served others. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Nathan C. Schaefer said, at the close of life, the question will not be how much have you got, but how much you have given. Not how much have you won, but how much you have denied. Not how much you have saved, but how much you have sacrificed. Not how much you were honoured, but how much you have served. Live to bless. It is the master key to a happy and fulfilled life. The more we live for others, the less we'll live for ourselves. The more we lose ourselves in serving others, the more we will find ourselves in the glory of God. As we focus on others' needs... 
God promises to focus on our needs. Philippians 4.19. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. My God will meet all your needs. Amen. Harry Ironside said, No one who really wants to count for God can afford to play at Christianity. Do not be afraid that you will ever lose by obeying every word in this book. You know, my heart has been touched this week to hear of elderly people around this world saying, don't give me a ventilator, give it to someone younger. I've lived a good life. I've lived a life that I can look back and say, it's all good. Give that ventilator to someone else. And in that act of sacrifice, in that act of giving, they've given their own life that someone else might live. And I wonder if God's people, his church, decided today to be the church wherever they are, to be the hands of Christ wherever they are, that we might have a resurrection, come on, a resurrection of God's purpose to see this world transform with the love of Christ. And we just simply have to choose this day whom we will serve. Will we serve ourself or will we serve our God by serving others? Jesus said, Whatever you do for the least of one of these, you do for me. Worship team, you can come up. I just want to really encourage you that right now, Jesus has got a plan for your life. Jesus came and entered into the city of Jerusalem, not with a plan for great triumph in a battle of kicking out the Romans out of Jerusalem. He came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday to die for you, to give his life for you. And I want to encourage you right now that you can receive that gift. You can receive that precious, beautiful gift of Jesus. And I just want to pray with you now if you'd like to receive that gift, if you want to understand that there's been stuff in your life that you know, you've done wrong, that you've messed up, that you've, you've run away from God and the things of God and, and the heart of God for you. You've sinned, you've done wrong, you've done stuff that hurts God and hurts others. You've lived for yourself. Then God has the answer and it's Jesus. And Jesus came to give his life on this earth, to came to give his life, to die for you, to take your bad stuff upon himself so that you might be able to relate to God. God says in his word, the wages of sin, the wages of stuff that we do is wrong, is death. But in Christ, we have eternal life. In him, we have salvation. And if you will receive Jesus today, if you will receive his promise, if you will believe that he died for you and he rose from the dead, the promise in God's word is that you will receive his salvation. You will receive life and life to the full. You will receive an abundance of his love in your life. And I want to encourage you right now, wherever you are, just to to get down on your knees and just repeat this prayer after me. Dear Father, I come to you now. Dear God, I come to you now. I know I've done stuff that have hurt you. I've done stuff that hurt others. I've been selfish. But thank you, Jesus, that you gave your life for me. That you came to show me how to live for others. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me on a cross. I believe that you died for me. And I believe that you rose from the dead. And right now, I confess, I speak with my mouth that you are Lord of my life. I receive you 
as my saviour. I believe that you rose from the dead to save me and to bring me into relationship with my Father in heaven. Right now, Jesus, I thank you. I receive you as my Lord, as my King, as my Saviour, and I will live for you all the days of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for your gift of your life for me. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, please get in touch with us. The contact details are on the screen. You can ring us or you can email us. We'd love to be in touch with you. We'd love to follow up with you, to to give you some materials, to send you a Bible, to, to connect you with people who can love you and care for you. Get connected with church, even online at the moment. I know it's difficult, but get connected. Reach out to us. We'd love to reach out to you. We're here. We want to pray for you. We want to be with you and love you and help you in whatever you're going through. We want to be the church to you, to be the hands of Christ to you, to be the feet, the mouth, the arms of action. We want to love you as Christ loved you.